Well, I have a confession to make this morning. I don't like filling up my car with gas. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I just like to see how far I can go. Sometimes, you know, that light comes on and you just wonder how much farther you can go. You ever had that moment where you thought that, you know? So early in my marriage, uh, Stephanie didn't know that about me when we got married, that I just didn't like it. You know, it's always too hot, too cold, too windy, too late, too early. Just not the right time to stop to get gas, right? So early in our marriage, we made uh, several trips back and forth from Alabama to Oklahoma. I was in seminary at ORU, and and so I had it down to where I was figuring out how many miles per gallon my car was getting, you know, the miles per hour, how long it was going to take to get places before the phone would tell you when you were going to arrive. So so we were there, and and we'd get close to Tulsa. We'd get over over that Oklahoma state line. We'd be moving toward the turnpike, that creek turnpike on I-40. And I'd be looking at that gas gauge going, I'm not, I'm not sure it's going to make it all the way, but I think I can get to the gas station at McDonald's on the turnpike. That sounded like a great plan, right? So we'd get on the road, and Stephanie wasn't paying attention, didn't realize where the gas gauge was. So I'd be going along, and all of a sudden, I would just start turning off the air conditioner. <laughs> then, I, then I'd turn off the cruise control. Then I slowed down the car a little bit, because I knew I was trying to conserve a little gas, because I was starting to get concerned, and it was a little below E, and I wasn't sure we were going to make it to that McDonald's. And she would look over, and she'd say, man, I'm getting hot in here. Can you turn the air on? And then she would look over, and she would see what I had done. And I would assure her vehemently that we were going to make it to that gas station at McDonald's, but I had no idea if we were going to make it or not. (laughs) You ever been there? All right. Well, we're going to do a little survey today. You got your phones out. If you uh, scan that QR code, you put your information in, you are rerouted. Uh, Over this next uh, season of time, if you didn't do that and you don't want to tell us that you were here today, you can still scan for those notes and you won't even have to give any information. It's all anonymous. Uh, There'll be a survey at the end when we do that. Hey, but here's what I want to do. I want you to turn your flashlight on. Turn your flashlight on. Hold it up when you have it. And I'm going to, I'm going to test you and see when you fill up your tank. Uh, with gas. All right. We've got a, a lot of folks in the room. We've, we brought the lights down so you have a little anonymity today. So go ahead and put your lights down now. Put them in your lap being ready to answer these questions. All right. So how many of you fill up your tank when you're at three quarters full? Anybody? Okay. There's a few people in the room. You know, in, in earlier service, Pastor David was in there. He started telling me this week that he started filling up at three quarters of a tank because the gas bill is a lot less when he does that. <laughs> That's kind of like a Boudreaux moment right there for him to think. Okay, that's free today. All right, so three quarters. You guys are overachievers. You'll never run out of gas. It's amazing that you do that. How about half tankers? Any half tankers here? You say, you know, half a tank, I'm going to fill up. Okay, pretty good number in the room. How about quarter tankers? Oh, that's even bigger. Okay, some of you are a little procrastinators like me. I see what you're doing. All right, how about when the light is on, it's time to get gas? All right, that's even more. How about below E, and I hope I make it? Wow. All right. One more question. How many of you have ever run out of gas driving the car? Wow. Some of you lied earlier. Wow, wow, wow. All right. Let's bring the lights up. All right. Don't look at your neighbor. You didn't see where they raised their hand or not. We're good. You know, there was one time in my life about 20 years ago that was the most memorable time I ever ran out of gas. Don't ask me how many times it's happened, but one time. Garrison was in kindergarten. We had just moved to Virginia. Northern Virginia is a commute uh, to D.C. for a lot of people. It is a, a traffic jam all hours of the day. But this particular morning, I got up late. The gas light was on the car, and I thought I had enough gas to get him to kindergarten and then fill up at the gas station next to the church where I work. So we're on this road, and there were a lot of commuter roads that ran perpendicular to the major highway that ran north and south going to D.C. Highway 1 was the, is the road that we were headed toward. And I get to the intersection of this commuter road and the Highway 1, which is the alternative to I-95. Some of you have heard of that. And I'm there in line, and I get to the front of the line. It's a three-lane road. I'm in the turn lane. There's two, uh, you know, basically it's a a two-way road with the turn lane in the middle. And I'm in the turn lane, and I get to front of the line. The light changes. My car starts sputtering, and I ran out of gas. This is commuter hour of the morning, and there are hundreds of cars already behind me waiting to go, and I realize I've got a problem. I've run out of gas. So it's amazing. I'd only been there a few weeks, still had Alabama tags. It's amazing how friendly the people of Virginia were as they were passing me, trying to get around and make that left turn to get on the Highway 1. You know, I'm kidding there. They were good people. 
we had a good Samaritan that actually picked up Garrison and helped get him to school. And then I walked over to the gas station and I got one of these cans right here and I filled it up. But you know, if you don't pay attention to the gauges on your car, you can end up with some really messy situations, right? And it's amazing, the cars these days, uh, you, you guys know the chip shortage. I, we have guys that work in the industry here. They can't get a car to sell right now because all the chips they say that are out and everything. But, but those cars are regulating and monitoring and making sure everything in your car is working right. And there are lights and bells and whistles that go off when things are not right, right? And most of us pay attention to those until our car gets pretty old. And then we say, well, we're just going to drive it until it dies, right? But most of us pay attention to those. If the oil light is on, it's a good indicator that you need to check the oil, right? If the if the if the thermostat's not working on on your car, if you're seeing it overheating, if the radiator's doing something, it's going to tell you on the gauges that are there on your car. Well, cars are really good at that. But as I've lived my life, and now I'm over fifty, I want to tell you something that I've also learned. Cars are really good at telling me that, but people are awful at self-regulating. You and I live in a culture where we just go until we break, and then we go and try to figure out how to fix it so we can keep going, instead of staying in a maintenance mode where we pay attention to the markers in our life. Wouldn't it be great if we had little gauges in our life where where we could know how we were doing, where we would know if we were depleted in an area or we were about to head into trouble? Wouldn't it be great if we we could forecast that? Wouldn't it be great if our spouses had those things, right? Stephanie really would love to have that about me, right? At any given time in my life, though, if I had a set of dashboard gauges that I was looking at, there would be all kinds of variations going on in my life. And I think it would be true of you as well. You know, we pride ourselves that we're making good time. When I'm driving a car, I want to know how fast I can get there, and, and, and we go. But sometimes we're going in a direction, and we don't even know where we're headed but we're making good time while we're getting there. It'd be good for us to be intentional about the journey we were on. You know, knowing that, as I was thinking about this message, I was thinking about how I was going to share today. Uh, It's a simple message today. The title of the message is Running on Empty. Running on Empty. And if you have the notes, you're going to see the opportunity to scan there. They're going to help you as you go through. We're going to have a a self-assessment we're going to do at the end. But As I was thinking of a verse that that really has been a marker verse for me for for a long time in my adult life, I thought of Solomon. I thought about the wisdom of Solomon. You guys know Solomon. He was the third king of Israel. He was young. He asked uh, God for wisdom. God gave him tremendous wisdom. He was the smartest man that ever lived. There were people that would come hundreds of miles just to hear him say a proverb and to give a philosophy of life. And it was because God had uniquely gifted him with wisdom. He's the guy that wrote Proverbs and Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes in our Bible. And, and uh, it, it Proverbs, some of my favorite uh, verses in the Bible, one of the go-to books for me is Psalms and Proverbs are right there for me when I'm reading through the Bible. But in Proverbs chapter 3 and 4, there's some verses I want to look at, specifically in Proverbs chapter 4. But 3 and 4, he talks a lot about wisdom and, and about leading your life well. In Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, I want to look at this verse today, and it's going to be the key verse uh, that we really spend our time with today. Sometimes we do large passages, and we do a narrative, and and we talk through points there. But today, I just want to stick with this one verse, because I think this one verse, just unpacking this one verse, is enough for me to try to figure out how to live that way all week. So Proverbs 4.23, you have it on the screen. You also have it in your notes there. Guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. That's the main verse, and and you guys know I like to have a big idea to go with that. And so, as I think about that verse and how we're going to apply that verse, and I think about the idea of running on empty, the big idea for me today is when I'm depleted and it's untreated, I live defeated. Say that to your neighbor. Look over to the left. When I'm depleted and it's untreated, I live defeated. Now look over to your neighbor to the right. When I'm depleted and it's untreated, I live defeated. One of your neighbors already said, I already know. I knew you were that way already. Solomon gives us a really 
clear nugget of wisdom. And when we look at that verse, the first word that, that really comes out to me as I'm looking at that verse is heart. And you and I know the heart. We know it's an organ in the body. We know it's pumping blood through our body. But when the Hebrews heard the word heart, it was something totally different than just that limited perspective that you and I have about heart or about love and emotion. Uh, it, it, it had a holistic approach to a person's life. So, when we talk about it, uh, it, it's interesting to notice that as they were talking about the heart, it was holistic, and it's interesting that the intellect, the part of the body that we would call the brain, there was no word for brain in the Hebrew. It was the heart that was the center of their intellect, the core of who they were. So, when Solomon was saying to guard your heart, he wasn't just saying your physical heart. He was saying their intellect, their mind, their decision-making that they were making. And he was saying to check the gauges, to monitor, to watch over, to protect the very core of who we are. Not just a physical organ. It was the intellectual and emotional activity, the, the heart. It was where we knew and we gained wisdom, where we understood and comprehended. It was the seat of emotions. We could have our heart be distressed, be full of joy, be full of fear, all from the heart. So, when we find verses in the Old Testament and we hear that Hebrew word heart, we're talking about a complex and complete picture of the core of who we are spiritually, emotionally, physically, and mentally. I think we lose that perspective when we try to separate our life into segments and say, well, this is my body, and this is my spirit, this is my mind, these are my emotions. I think we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And I think the Hebrews had it right when they really talked about it being a holistic approach to guarding our heart. So, when I think about that and I think about the opportunity, in fact, when you, when you think of heart, the concept of a broken heart came out of Hebrew culture. We talk about having broken-hearted people. That, that came from the Hebrew culture. The heart was the place of choices, decisions, and, dis, and discernment in your life, the core of the person. When I, when I hear Solomon say, guard your heart above all else, though, I start thinking of what the gauges may look like on the dashboard of my life. About 10 or 12 years ago, there was a, a pastor that was going through a, a tough time of ministry in his life. He was hitting mid midlife, really went through a, not necessarily a midlife crisis, but just a correcting time in his life. And he had a book that he put out. It was called Leading on Empty. He had a talk that he gave. And, and I heard it at a time in my life where I didn't necessarily need it at the time, but I needed it over this last 12 years several times. And I was glad I was a part of hearing him unpack the journey that he had been on. And in his book and his talk, he talked about the dashboard of his life. And he talked about how important it was for him to monitor and guard what was going on in his life so that he didn't get back to the depleted state that he had gotten to when he was leading on empty. I was reminded of that. Uh, Natalie goes to a church in Tuscaloosa. She's my daughter that's down in Alabama. And, and her pastor had a, a list that he put together as well recently. And, and he was going through the, the monitor that he had in his life, the, the dashboard that he had in his life. And so, today I want to take the dashboard that I heard those years ago and that I've kind of applied in my life over the years and take this dashboard that this pastor just shared and merge them together. And today your dashboard would look maybe a little different than mine. But I think we're going to see some commonality of what makes us fearfully and wonderfully made and commonality of what it looks like when the gauges go wrong. So, let's look at these 12. And some of you are looking at me today and you're thinking, he's going to have 12 points to the message. We're not going to get home for lunch. I trust you. Trust me. I hope you can trust me. We're not going to be here long as we go through these. So, let's, let's go through these. I just want you to remember the big idea though. When I'm depleted and it's untreated. I live defeated. The first, uh, the first gauge on the dashboard of my life and on the dashboards that we're looking at is our faith life. Our relationship with God, our involvement with the Bible, with prayer, with worship is something that we have to take note of and we have to monitor. It's sometimes the first thing that we jettison when we get busy in life. But it's the one thing that kind of keeps us on this pathway that we're talking about. So, if I had to put one gauge that you want to really put a marker on, how's your faith life? How about your marriage life? If you're married, your spouse is a primary and core relationship in your life. Sometimes we can put that gauge to the side, and maybe we've been married for a while, maybe we think there's no issue, but when's the last time you ask your spouse how it was really going? 
When's the last time you had an honest conversation about what the, the gauge would look like if you compared notes of where your marriage is headed? Again, so often we wait until the gauge is already empty before we address some of these issues. And so today, I want to look at these 12, and then I want to look at three, three different uh, statements that, that Solomon makes in that one verse that are going to help us evaluate where we are on the journey. How about your family life? How's your relationship with your children, with your grandchildren, if you have grandchildren, with the extended family? Are you in life-giving relationships with the people in your family? Or is there a, a, an area of depletion or weakness going on right now? Office or school life. We've got students in here, college students, high school students, middle school students. We've got people in industries of all kind. How is it? Are you spending the right amount of time on what you're supposed to be focused on? Are you spending the right amount of time at work? Are you appropriately challenged? Are you appropriately applying the gifts and talents God's given you in the workplace? Or is it overwhelming? Or is it lacking in some way? Here's one that 12 years ago didn't seem as important, but it's more important every day. It's changing the way that we live our life. It's our digital life. My iPhone loves to tell me about my screen time every day, and sometimes I argue with my iPhone. It says I've been on the phone three and a half, four hours sometimes, right? I'm like, there's no way I've been on the phone that long, but I'll look back and I'll see the timestamps and recognize that I truly have been on there. When I just go on Facebook to check a few things and then an hour later I realize an hour is gone, the question is, is that fulfilling your life or is that a draining effect on your life as you go forward? We spend so much time in front of computers, in front of televisions, in front of anything digital. How's your digital life? Is it fulfilling or is it one of the issues that may need to be looked at on your dashboard? The next one's ministry life, and some of you are going to go, I'm not a pastor, you're the one that has to deal with that. You've got a ministry life you've got to worry about. But, but the reality is, at this church, and we teach this and we believe this, every person that attends and calls this their church is a minister, because to minister is to serve. And so you serve just like I serve. Some of us do it full time for our vocation, but we all have a calling to serve. So how is your serving life? How, how are you using the gifts and the talents that God has given you are you using them appropriately? Are you engaged in them? Or have you let that go dormant where you're not even sure what you would put on that gauge when it comes to how you're involved in ministry? Ministry is much more than just coming to church or being part of a group. It's about actively participating with the gifts that God has given you. And there's a fulfillment that comes from that. The next one, the next one gets people in a lot of trouble in a short amount of time. How about your financial life? The way we earn, spend, save, and give. If we slack in that area and we don't monitor it, it's not long before we have some major issues in our life and they bleed over into all the other areas of our heart. How about that? Social life, time with friends, right friends, influences, relationships that are toxic, relationships that are life-giving. Where would you put the gauge on your social life? The next one's a little bit bigger word, attitudinal life. It's much more than just one attitude or one emotion that you have, but it's the whole overarching approach that you have to the way you live your life. Are you a joyful person? Are you a pessimistic person? Are you a resilient person when you're facing struggles and, and difficulties? Our attitude so often informs our heart in situations when things get difficult, and we can choose to guard the attitude that we have in our life. How about the creative life? Not just the people who are artists who do music or maybe paint pictures, but your creative life is your dreams and your plans for the future. Have you dusted those off? Are you familiar? Are they alive and well? Are you living on purpose? Do you see the dream and the plan that's in front of you that God's given you? Our mental and emotional life, my mind and my thoughts, how's your thinking? Are you dealing with anxious thoughts? Are you dealing with depression? Are you dealing with things that are draining you in your mind and your emotions? And the last one's physical life. Exercise, nutrition, and sleep. It's amazing what a good night's sleep will do to an emotional state that you're in. The older I get, the more I, I recognize just how important how I treat my body affects the whole person of who I am. 
So now you've got those 12 gauges that we're looking at. And each of those gauges are a part of what I say is guarding your heart this morning. And your gauges may be a little more intricate. Maybe there's some areas that you would look at. But I want to go back to that verse now, and I want to see Solomon's wisdom for us today and lift three ideas from that verse. The first thing that I notice in that verse, guard your heart. It's personal. It's personal. You can't have me guard your heart, and you can't guard my heart from me. I'm reminded when Garrison turned 16 that our insurance company had a deal this, 10 years ago. They, they had this deal. It's very common now, but they had a device that you could plug into your diagnostic port on your car, and it would track where you drove. It would track how fast you were driving, whether you had jackrabbit starts, whether you had sharp braking. Uh, it, I mean, it, it just took a diagnostic of everything, and it would send a, a text at the end of the day to let you know how your, how your 16-year-old was driving. That sounded like a brilliant idea to me. Doesn't that sound brilliant? So Garrison and I were sharing a car, and, and so at the end of each day, around dinner time, I would get a text that would give me an aggregate total of all the different infractions that Garrison had during the day, right? Well, this particular day, we uh, got home, we were having dinner, and I got that text, and it showed that uh, the car had been going 70 miles an hour, that there had been two sharping braking incidents, a couple of jackrabbit starts, and I was like, Garrison, we've got to talk a little bit about you driving. If you're going to drive like that, we're going to have to talk. And then I look at the timestamp. <laughs> I was the one driving the car when all that happened. <laughs> and I lost the ability to really speak anything into Garrison's life at that moment. <laughs> it's personal. I can't guard your heart. I can help you. I can give you ideas of what to look for. This is a personal journey, and it's meant to be a personal journey. God intended for us to guard the core of who we are. It's so important that we take that initiative to guard our heart. The second thing that I notice when I look at this verse is the phrase, above all else. Guard your heart above all else. It's prioritized prioritized above all else. He didn't say it's one of the important things that you're going to do today. He said above all else, the primary focus in your life can be to guard and monitor your life. That sounds so different than what we would say when we start our day of what we're trying to do. How much time do you give reflecting and monitoring where your heart's going? We speed through life. We make decisions. So many of those decisions don't start in the decision time. They start in your heart. And just a flaw or a gauge that's out of whack in your heart can lead to a, a lifetime of difficult decisions that you don't want to have to make. We don't just drift toward God's best. We have to work at guarding our heart. How are, your, how are your gauges reading? Jesus said in the New Testament, where, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. You've got, you've got two areas in your life that you can spend a lot of time, your time and your treasure, your time and your treasure. So if you want to know where your heart is, just start tracking what you're doing with your time and your treasure, and you're going to find your heart somewhere intertwined in that. Reflect on that and recognize the priority that you have and the opportunity you have to guard your heart above all else. Third thing I would say is it's predictive, for it determines the course of your life. It determines the course of your life. It doesn't say it, it could determine, it, it, it might determine. It says it will determine the course of your life. The health of the core of who you are will ultimately show in the life that you live. You want to know your future? Look at your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Solomon later in Proverbs said, as water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. Show me your heart. I'll show you where your life is headed. So how can we guard our heart? How can we monitor how we're doing? 
We obviously have these assessment tools we can give, but what are some things that we could do? What are some practical things we can do? And these, these are four things that you're going to say, I could have done these, I knew these, but today is more about reminding you than it is instructing you in something new. The first thing I would say is we have to come closer to God. James 4, 8 says, come close to God and he will draw close to you. If you want to have that relationship you've never had with God, you've got to do something you've never done before. Solomon in chapter 3 of Proverbs, just a, a chapter before this, said, trust in the Lord with what? All your heart and lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and what's going to happen? He's going to make your path straight. The first step to really guarding and monitoring your heart and having the heart that God wants you to have is surrender to God. And so many of you have surrendered to God and you've, you have made that commitment to be a Christ follower, but some of you today, you're hearing this and you know the condition of your heart. I listed some things that whether you're a Christian or not, you're dealing in those areas. And today may be the day where you recognize the brokenness in your heart and you make that decision to surrender it to God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The second thing I would say, be accountable to someone. We may not be able to guard each other's hearts, but we can definitely support each other as we're trying to go on that journey. Go to God to forgiveness and go to God's people for support. You guys know we roll out groups and care groups on Monday nights and all kinds of uh, discipleship type activities. The men's groups and women's groups that are going on are prime examples of people who've made a decision to say, just hearing God's word on a Sunday morning isn't enough. I've got to go deeper. I've got to be in relationship with other people that are trying to live the life that I'm living. I'm so encouraged by the men's groups that I, I'm able to stick my head in and see what's going on. They're using assessment tools that they're sharing how they're doing in their emotions and in their thought life and things that are going on. So many of you are a part of that, but some of you haven't made that journey yet. And I just encourage you, find a group if you're not in a group that's life-giving and make that a part of your journey. Be accountable to someone. Seek God for forgiveness and go to God's people for support. You're going to notice these sound a lot like growth track. These th steps that I'm talking about are exactly what we expect and the promises of God that we have over this church. That if we're going to turn to God, that we can know God, and we're going to turn to other people for support, that we're going to maximize that potential by living life in community. That we're going to, number three, discover our God-given purpose. If you want to overcome a depleted life, Find how God has gifted and shaped you and what he's called you to in purpose and start doing that. And your energy level, your enthusiasm, and your outlook on life is going to change when you're serving the purposes of God. Because you were made for so much more than living a mediocre life. And the last thing I would say you know, as I look at this fourth thing is live your life for something that really matters. If you want to see those gauges improve, live your life in a way that has eternity and focus, whether it be for your family, for your marriage, for the people that your workplace or wherever it is. If you have an intentionality, if you see the vision and the dream for what could become, it will engage you in a way that will bring energy back to your soul and your heart will come alive because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't just live your life, but live a life that'll last for eternity. My father-in-law was a commercial airplane pilot for American for many years. He's retired now, but I would have times where I would talk to him. I was always enamored. When I get on an airplane, I love to look in, into the cockpit as I'm going into the seating area. And, and there are so many bells and whistles and buttons and gauges. Are you guys amazed when you look at a, a, an airplane, a commercial airplane? It's amazing what they have. They have all these instruments in front of them to make that plane go where we want it to. We're so happy they have every one of them. But the reality is when they, when they go uh, on uh, a flight plan and they're kind of deciding the, the flight plan that they're taking, uh, they have two sets of flight rules that they can fly by. And I'm oversimplifying this. You, you pilots in the room, you can laugh at me later and tell me I had no idea what I was talking about, but it made for a good sermon illustration, so we're going with it. <laughs> you can fly by visual flight rules, 
Or you can fly by instrument flight rules. Visual flight rules are usually used when you're in an area where you're taking off and it's blue skies. There's no clouds that are going to occlude you from seeing the horizon or objects you need to be aware of, uh, anything that would uh, cause you to be worried about the wind or anything else. You, you basically can fly visually with, with a few gauges. But then there's another set that they call the instrument flight rules. And that's when you're flying and you know you're going into a storm. And you know that you're not going to have visibility. You're going to be in a bank of clouds. Uh, it's nighttime. You can't see what's going on. And you have to pretty much fly that plane with the gauges that are in front of you. I think too many of us live our life and we think that we can just make it on the visual flight rules, that we can take off and we'll deal with whatever comes. We may look at a gauge from time to time. We may think that we've got it all figured out because the skies are blue. But the reality is if you fly long enough, if you go far enough, if you go to an area, you're going to end up getting into some turbulence. You're going to end up getting into some clouds. Nobody's immune from that. And you're going to end up in a situation where those instruments are going to be very important to you. So my encouragement to us in a moment, we're going to have an opportunity to do a self-assessment. My encouragement to us is find some instrument flight rules. And the place that you find the instrument flight rules is God's Word. Find some instrument flight rules for your life and apply them on a regular basis and monitor how you're doing with what God's Word says. And your life will make it. Storms will come and go. Challenges will come and go. But you'll have the assurance that the instruments in front of you are leading you the way you need to go. So in these next few moments, some of you have already gotten to this part. If you had your phone, there are some sliders. There's 12 different areas that I talked about. I want you to take just a minute or two. If you don't have your phone, if your spouse has the phone, just get out one of the offering envelopes, but the list is there on the screen, all 12 of them there. And what I want you to do, there's an E on one end for empty, and there's an F on the other end for full. And I want you to personally assess where you are in those 12 areas of your life, the ones that apply to you. If you're not married, I've already given you a pass on that, but you got to answer all the rest. But just know as you fill this out, I would love for you to hit submit at the end. It's not attached to your phone. It's not attached to your name. These are anonymous surveys. This is totally separate from the attendance that you did. And it's going to allow us to see as a pastoral staff areas that we can strengthen to support you. But I want you to take a minute and prayerfully consider that. And I'm going to come back and then we're going to have another action step that we're going to take. So do that right now. anybody you can keep working on it if you need to but I want to keep moving the service forward <laughs> definitely take these to heart make a list of these uh, make these uh, maybe prayerful consideration of what your gauges need to look like going forward but my question for you is is there an area that's low or depleted today is probably a good day for a fill up 
here's some questions that you can ask. What, what's the most important thing right now? Out of the things I just scored, what's the most important thing that I scored low on? You can't do everything, but you can do something today. What one thing, if it got better, would make the biggest difference? What am I not doing that I should be doing? And what am I doing that I should stop doing? Many of you in the room aren't old enough to remember the gas shortages we had in the 1970s here in the U.S. I, that first service, I said I'd have to explain it to you guys because I knew y'all were the younger ones, right? How many of you in the room remember 1973 and 79 when we ran out of gas? Everybody remember that? Some of y'all don't. I don't know if Oklahoma ran out of gas or not. I lived in Slidell, Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana in 1979. And here's what happened. Uh, we ran out of so much gas, the reserve and everything they had for gas was going out. And, and so they decided gas stations were running out of gas so badly, there were miles of gas stations, just miles of people waiting for gas. That they started rationing gas based on your license plate number, if you had an even or an odd number as the last number on your plate. So I remember in 1979, we'd go to New Orleans and my dad would have to schedule our drive time so that we would end up making sure that we had gas when we needed it on the day that we could get gas. It was amazing. There, you would wait in line for an hour, and if you waited, if you were like the people in here that said they waited for that light to come on, if you got in the gas line, you were out of gas before you even got to the line. And what would happen is you'd wait in a line for an hour or two hours, and, and, and they would run out of gas before you could even buy any gas. They would limit you to eight gallons some days. They would tell you to come back, and, and you wouldn't even know if you were going to be able to make that trip to Grandma's on a holiday because you didn't know if you were going to have enough gas to make it or even a gas station that would give you gas. That sounds so foreign to some of you young people who haven't experienced that, but that was something I actually lived through and many people in the room have lived through. But here's what I want to tell you today. We serve a God who is not rationing what you need this morning when it comes to the gauges. He's not telling you that on Monday and Wednesday, Lawson gets what he needs, but then Justin has to come on Tuesday and Thursday. He's here and he's able to meet you right where you are with whatever is depleted in your life. And it doesn't mean that some of this isn't going to be worked out by process. So often I don't want you to believe that just one prayer, sometimes God will do it by one prayer and you're going to be able to go and you'll be full again and you'll be able to move forward. But so often he chooses to make us live in process. And so the decision you make today will be a trickle charge back to where you need to be. And it'll be steps that are along the way that bring wholeness and completeness. But we have a God. If we draw close to him, he draws close to us. And so today I want you to stand. Let's all stand together. We're going to have an opportunity here in a moment to respond one more time, and then we're going to go into worship song one more time. But I want you to stand, and I just want you to bow your head right now. As you filled out all those forms, if you had one area in your life that you were close to empty or you were empty on that you filled out, I don't want anyone looking around. I'm not trying to pull you forward for anything. I just want to pray for you. Would you just raise your hand right now while everyone says bowed and let me know that there was one area or more that you want prayer for that we can move forward in. Okay, I see hands all over the room. You can put your hands down. I just want to pray for you. And then after this prayer, I want this worship team to lead us in that song, Firm Foundation, that we ended our worship with today. And then we're going to go out of here charged up because I think this lesson will live on beyond anything that we do in the altar. We're going to have people that hang around at the end that will pray for you if you need it. If you've never surrendered your life to Christ, we've got people down here that would love to talk to you at the end of the service as well. But I think that this is one that's going to be lived out as we go out charged up and full of what God's going to do. So let's pray right now. Lord, I just thank you right now as we've had this time of reflection of guarding our heart. Lord, of making it a priority, God, of, of seeing where it's headed and being predictive of our future, God. We ask you to fill us with what we have need of, God. Where we're empty, we thank you that you are full, and we thank you that you are offering fullness to us, God. I pray for healings to take place. I pray for relationships to be restored. I pray for energy to be restored. I pray for emotions to be healed. And God, I thank you that you are going to raise us up so that we can look at our life, that we can look at these dashboards and we'll see improvement, that we'll see the call of God on our life, that we'll see the vision you have for our life, that you will lift us up, that you will lift our families up, God, so that people will look and they'll say, what's different about you? And we can say, it's because I decided to surrender my life to God completely and move forward in what he says in his word. 
Lord, just empower us. You are our firm foundation this morning. I thank you that as we sing this song, as we lift our hands, you are going to minister exactly what is needed in a powerful way. And we thank you for that in the matchless and powerful name of Jesus.